and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The title of my sermon tonight is The First Begotten of the Dead, and that's what we're going to be talking about. This morning we talked about how Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. Now, begotten means brought forth, right? Or sent, or, or manifest, He was sent out. Begotten can mean born, or exposed, or brought forth, essentially is, is the most common definition. So here it's saying that Jesus was the first one brought forth from the dead. Now, I want you to think about this phrase here, because... This morning we learned that He is the only Son of God, right? Jesus is part of the Trinity, God the Son, and He is the only one that's been manifest, sent down in the flesh. And, you know, people would say, well, well God can't die. How can He be the first begotten of the dead? And obviously God can't die. The eternal God, the eternal Godhead, you know, it says that He became human flesh. He became mankind, just like we are, and He died in the flesh, and he, you know, in that human life, he was down, sent to hell. And Jesus conquered death and hell. We're going to see that here. So he allowed his human life to die. Now, he was still God. He was still everlasting. And you think about how human life and human death are creations of God. Think about it, right? Mankind did not exist until God created mankind. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that's when life began. This was a creation of God. Sin entered the world and death by sin, right? That was Adam when he sinned against God. He ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Death entered into the world as a punishment for sin. So death also is a creation. So God the creator entered into his own creation. He had life as human life and he died as human life. So those are creations of God. He entered into his own. And God the Son, or Jesus Christ, he became flesh, and he allowed his flesh to die, to be killed. He allowed his soul to be cast into hell. And then it says that he was raised. Being raised by the power of God, he became the first begotten from the dead. So we see here, he says, and Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Jesus is the first one to be resurrected. You say, well, now, wait a minute. There's a bunch of other people that were resurrected. Yes, that's true, but not resurrected unto life eternal. There were people that Jesus brought back to life, and they died again. They're in the grave. Their body is in the grave. Their soul is in heaven. And one day, they will be resurrected also in the likeness that Jesus was resurrected. They will come back from the dead. The resurrection is an essential part of the gospel. And, you know, believing that Jesus is the Son of God, that's a big part of the gospel. We talked about that this morning. And tonight we're going to be talking about the resurrection. How that Jesus was the first begotten from the dead. I want you to look at verse 17 in this chapter. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. Now this is Jesus speaking. He says, I'm from the beginning. I am from the end. He says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now that right there, this one chapter gives us these two verses that gives us a glimpse into our own resurrection. How is it he has power over the grave and power over the death through resurrection? He has the keys of hell and death. He has conquered death and hell and he gives us victory over it by our faith in him. I want you to go to Acts chapter 13. So it says, I, I'm alive. He says, I was dead and I am alive forevermore. One day we will all be resurrected to be alive forevermore, never to die again. In Hebrews 2 it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. God tasted death for every man. He laid down his life for us so that we can be saved, and now anybody can be saved if they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
It's up to us. It's our decision. It's our choice. He has made it freely available. I don't care how big your sin is. I don't care what's in your past. It's been forgiven. He died for all of your sins. He tasted death for every man. He took the punishment you deserve, right? The wages of sin is death. We deserve death and hell, the second death, and he has redeemed us. He is our redeemer. You're in Acts chapter 13. Look at verse number 32. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. As it is also written in the second Psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Right, in Psalm chapter 2, in fact, keep your finger there, let's go to Psalm chapter 2. Let's take a look at this. Go to Psalm chapter 2. So when was Jesus begotten according to this verse? When was he begotten from the dead here? Was it, was it when he was born of a virgin? No, it says when he was born from the dead. When he was raised up from the dead is what Acts 13, he says, the day he was raised up is when the Father said, this day have I begotten thee. So Jesus being the first begotten of the dead, there was a day where Jesus rose again. Right? We celebrate Easter time. We call it Resurrection Sunday. Those are biblical phrases. I, you know, we're, we're going to do that next year in 2019. And, you know, that's righteous. That's a good thing to remember the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in Psalm chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, who's the, who's the anointed? Jesus Christ. He says, the kings of the world hate Jesus Christ. They hate Christians. Right? If you ask the world, they would say, Christians, that's the enemy. Christians, that's the problem. They're the one causing all the problems today. Look at verse number 6. Yet... Have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion? Now, we read this morning, I believe it was Matthew 26, where it says, For this purpose was he born, to be a king. Jesus would be that king one day, but, you know, that holy hill Zion. This isn't talking about a mound of dirt in the Middle East. This is talking about heavenly Jerusalem. That's the city that the forefathers looked for. That's the city that we look for. I could care less what happens to earthly Jerusalem, earthly Israel, or Palestine, as your older Bibles call it. That has nothing to do with my salvation. Right? They don't even own that land. God's in charge of it. And the Antichrist is going to set up his kingdom there. And the Zion we look forward to is in heaven. So Jesus died. And, you know, there's, this psalm sort of has some millennial tendencies to it about when Jesus comes back in his reigning. Look at the next verse. Verse 7. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Right? The resurrected Christ will return and he will rule and reign over the earth for a thousand years. For greater than a thousand years. And we will reign with them. Right? He goes on, he says, that he will give them the heathen for his inheritance. These are millennial promises. That Zion that Jesus is in, hey, he's, it's in heaven now, and one day it'll be on the earth. Look at verse 12. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. You know salvation only comes from putting your trust in the Son of God? That's it. That's the only option. Go back to, to Acts chapter 13. So the day, what it said in verse 33 in Acts 13, it said the day that he raised him up is the day that he said, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So when was Jesus begotten from the dead? That day, that resurrection. That's when he was begotten. Look at verse 34. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now, no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore, he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Now, you guys probably recognize this. This is also quoted in Acts chapter 2. It's quoting Psalm 16, verse 10. It says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, he died, it, the human body died. The flesh did not decompose, did not enter into rigor mortis because he resurrected. Meanwhile, his soul went to hell. He suffered for our sins and he conquered hell and death. He has the keys. Now he can offer us forgiveness. He has paid the price 100%. Look at verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. So here, they're standing in the synagogue at Antioch, and they're telling them the story. And they bring it up to Jesus, and they say, He is the one that died and rose again. He has conquered your sin. He says, through Him is the forgiveness of sin. Look at verse 39. And by Him, all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Go to Hebrews chapter 1. What a beautiful promise. He says, hey, you couldn't keep the law. You weren't good enough to get into heaven. There are none righteous. No, not one. Thank God. Thank God that he sent his son to die for our sins. Thank God he has conquered death and hell to be the first begotten from the dead. And one day we will be resurrected in his likeness. He was the first. And one day we will be in his image as well. You're in Hebrews chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Verse 2. Hath in these last days spoken unto him, unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he also made the world. Right? Jesus was the creator. He made the worlds. Verse 3. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. So once he died for our sins, you know the story, he was resurrected, you know, at the tomb he says, touch me not, I have not yet ascended to my father. He ascends, Hebrews gives us some insight into that, that he set his blood down, right? He was the high priest, he was the sacrifice, it was his blood that was put on the altar for our sins. He came back down to earth, the same day he came back down, and then he's telling Thomas, touch me, feel me, you know, put your hand on my side, put your, put your finger through my hand. So he was saying, look, I am flesh. I am that same Jesus. This is a bodily resurrection. He preached for 40 days. He ascended up on high. And Jesus has all power in heaven and earth. Right? He is now the authority over salvation. He has been given the power over hell. Look at verse 4. Being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be unto me a son. So here we see this similar phrase. He's talking about that, that promise in Psalm 2, that we would have a redeemer. We would have a conquering Christ to redeem us. He was the first begotten from the dead, and we will follow through. And he, again, highlighting, this was the son. It was the father that sent him. And the angels can't compare you know, people try to say that the angels are, the, are sons of God, but that doesn't hold up according to biblical doctrine. Biblical doctrine would teach us sons of God are believers, and the Son of God is God the Son. And it's God the Son that died for our sins. And you know, angels don't have a body. They are a celestial being. We are terrestrial. So an angel doesn't even have a body, but the Son of God came down in a body and died in that body, and rose again in that body, something no angel could do. Look at verse number six. And again, when he bringeth the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he saith, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So here he gives us a glimpse into the celestial realm, right? What is an angel? What is a spirit? He says it's like fire. Right? Science might, say, might call it plasma, right? Because we're given a comparison to celestial things. It says there are terrestrial bodies and celestial bodies. A celestial body is a heavenly body. Well, what's that? What's the sun made of? Well, it's kind of like fire, right? So what are angels made of? Well, maybe it's like what science would call plasma, right? Every particle of matter can be in solid, liquid, gas, or plasma, 
Right? So angels do not have a body as the Son did, as we do. They are ministering spirits. He commanded all of the angels to worship the Son. Now, you know, there was one angel that tried to get the Son to worship him, right? Lucifer, and he'll be cast into hell forever. Uh, look at verse number 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh, maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. That's from everlasting to everlasting. That's the, he didn't say, Thy, so, thy throne, O oh, oh, he, he It does not say, Thy throne, O God, is for 33 years. Right? It doesn't say it's from the virgin birth until the death of the cross. It says it's from everlasting to everlasting. It's forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Listen, salvation has always been freely available to all that would believe on the promise of the Lamb of God. The promise of the resurrection. The promise of the redemption of sin. And listen, the gospel has always been the same, but it has not always been as... as uh, it, uh, taught or exposed as it is today. We have more scriptures probably than they had back then, but they still had faith in what God said. Right? They believed they could call on the Lord and be saved. They believed that God would send His Son, the Lamb of God, to be the sacrifice. They trusted and they were saved. You're in Hebrews 5. Look at verse number 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now think about who we're writing to here, right? This is written to the Hebrews. They had the Levitical priesthood. They had the sons of Aaron that kept the office of a priest. And where did they get that information? Who told them how to do that? Well, he was shown the image, right, in heaven of a spiritual tabernacle. And there was a high priest spiritually in heaven that they saw a picture of and that's what Aaron was commanded to do on the earth right so they were just copying what they saw in heaven he said he showed the pattern and he said now make it in the earth according to that pattern so the men that were high priests on the earth in the days of Levitical priesthood were copying what was done in heaven and guess who that high priest was Jesus Christ that's right so they saw Jesus and it says here that they offered sacrifices for sin look at verse 2 who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is also compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. So we're saying the high priest would, would make that sacrifice to pay for the sins of the people and also for himself. Verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So again, who was the high priest? Jesus Christ. Who was it that had to die for us? Jesus Christ. So what they did in the Old Testament was a picture of of Christ to come. In, in the ordinances that they were keeping, they were going through the motions, they were telling the story about Jesus coming to pay for our sin. Look at verse number 8. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Right? Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He is the author of salvation. It is the word of God that we're born again by. And he's saying here that he learned obedience. Although he's a son, he still obeyed the Father. Now go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. He says, Yet he learned obedience. In Philippians 2 it says, Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found and fashioned as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth. 
and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You know what glorifies the Father when you confess that Jesus is God, that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus humbled himself and died for our sins. That pleases the Father. You're in John chapter 5. Look at verse 21. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Right? Quicken means to give life. He's saying the Father raised up people and gave them life. He's saying the same thing, that Jesus, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Jesus also has the power of resurrection of life. Verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Famous verse, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Now this is an interesting concept here. What's he talking about? The resurrection, right? We will come back from life. Whose voice are we going to hear when it's time for us to be resurrected? Christ, the Son of God. We're going to hear the Son's voice call us unto this resurrection. Look at verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Again, whose voice are they hearing? The Son of God. They're not hearing the Father. The Father has given that authority to the Son. The Father raises people and he says, hey, and I've given that power of quickening, of giving life to the Son. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So Jesus Christ being the first begotten of the dead. Jesus Christ being the first one to raise from the dead and be raised eternally gives us that power. He will call us at that resurrection. It's His voice that we'll hear. He is the one that has been given authority over judgment and we will rule and reign with Him. He will reign on the earth in authority and we will be right there with Him. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 15, look at verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Right? So again, he's introducing this is the gospel. And if you really believe this, you're saved. If you believed it in vain, if you, well, I'll give Jesus a try. No, it doesn't work that way. Once you believe, you're saved forever. It's not a temporary thing. I've had people, oh, well, I used to be a Christian. I quit doing that. Well, you never were a Christian. You were a fake Christian like the rest of them. That doesn't please God. I'll give Jesus a try, and if my finances are, you know, increased, then, then I'll keep on trying Jesus. It doesn't work that way. These are spiritual blessings. Look what he says in verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So the gospel that we preach, the gospel we have received, that we are saved by, is the fact that it's Jesus Christ we're trusting, that he was buried, he went to the grave, he went to hell, he paid for our sins, and he's risen again. Proving he has power over hell and death. He has the keys and the authority over it, and now he gives that to us. He says, hey, do you want to defeat the grave? You want victory over death? You can have it by putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Again, there were people that were resurrected. Even in the Old Testament, there were people that came back to life. 
The New Testament, there are many examples of it. When Jesus died on the cross, it says that many of the graves of the saints were opened. And then three days later, when he resurrected, it says that those saints came out of the grave, they went into the cities, and they preached. Now, the graves were open for three days. It was probably stinking. These people come out that were saints, people that were believers, that came back to life. But you know, they're not still alive. They're dead. They're not alive today. They died again. Lazarus brought back. Guess what? He died again. He was not given that everlasting resurrection. Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept to die no more. Look at verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So this is a great parallel because Adam, is the, Adam was from the Father, right? But now he's not the only begotten Son of God. Adam was a Son of God, and Adam came forth from the Father, but not in the same way the Messiah did. Adam was made in flesh, and Adam sinned because Adam was not God. Christ was God. Christ could not have sinned. It was impossible, although he was in sinful flesh. It says, so through Adam came in death when he sinned, so through Christ comes the resurrection. Look at verse 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Right? So Jesus Christ resurrected on Easter, on the Lord's day, and then at the Lord's coming, what we see in Matthew 24 and uh, Revelation chapter 6, at Christ's second coming, the dead will be raised again. The dead saints will live, will be given a new body. The rapture, we which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them. Look at verse 24. Then cometh the end, right? So that's after the thousand years. After Christ has reigned for a period of greater than a thousand years, we reigned with him. It says, then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So there's that final resurrection, the resurrection when every person in the grave will hear the, the voice of the Son of God. Even those in hell will hear the voice of the Son of God calling them up for judgment at the great white judgment throne. Look at verse 25. <clears throat> for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now there are people that say, well, the kingdom is already here today. We, we were talking about this earlier in between service, you know. God's kingdom is here in your heart. It is a spiritual kingdom, and there are many false religions, like we mentioned the Calvinists and the Catholics, that would say, oh, well, there is no millennial reign. Christ won't come back to the earth and reign. You know, that's just figurative. He's reigning today. We are in his kingdom. He has all authority. You know, we were talking about the political aspects, the John MacArthur, Ben Shapiro thing. Oh, if somebody would just tell Ben Shapiro that Jesus is ruling right now, then he would quit being a Jew. Look, that's confusing. That's a lie. Jesus said, we're going to be raised again. We'll rule and reign with him. There will be a millennium. There's a, a thousand years. And then Satan is loosed for a little season. Those things have to be played out. But a preterist or an amillennialist would say those things have already happened. But it's clear that there has to be another resurrection, then come at the end, when he'll deliver up the kingdom to the Father. So that kingdom in the thousand years will be delivered up. That kingdom is not here yet. The kingdom that's on earth now is in your heart. Right? It's inside of you. It's spiritual. We are in the kingdom of God, spiritually speaking right now. It says we're seated in heavenly places. If you die right now, absent from the body, present with the Lord in the kingdom of heaven. And one day when he brings his kingdom to earth, he will rule and reign. He will execute judgment. We will live by his law. Amen. So those things have to be played out. And the, those amillennialists or preterists that, that don't understand this, how do you reconcile verse 26? Look again what it says. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. We still have death on the earth. It, you understand what Jesus in the millennia, if you look at those promises that we see in the book of Isaiah, guess what? There isn't death. You're not going to die unless you die a sin or a cursed, right? You're going to live. You're going to have access to the river of life, to the tree of life. There's no reason there should be sickness or weeping, right? We're going to have freedom under God's law, the law of liberty that sets us free. 
And that's his, per so death will go away when we have access again to the tree of life, to the river of living water. In Revelation 1, 18, he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That, now, so the last enemy that must die is death. That last enemy to be destroyed is death. Jesus said he was dead and now he is alive forevermore. So that's what we look forward to in the resurrection, to be alive forevermore. Amen. Won't happen in this flesh. Yeah. Hey, if you get resurrected at, at the coming of the Lord, if you make it to that point, even this flesh itself will be transformed into flesh like he has. It'll be a celestial body, a different type of body. Look at verse 35, 1 Corinthians 15, 35. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Right, so, well, I don't understand the resurrection. What do you mean we're going to get a new body? We're going to change at the twinkling of an eye. What is all this talking about? Look at verse 40. There are also celestial bodies, right, that's heavenly, and bodies terrestrial. The terrain is earthly. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. If you get out your telescope and you, you look at a star and then you compare it to the sun, they blow, both have some sort of a fire-like glory. Like, wow, that's amazing, right? Well, in the resurrection, we're going to have similar glory, but it'll be different from one another. Look what it teaches, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Right? The weakness and unprofitableness of this body won't last forever. However, a permanent body is coming. He says it's, so, it's raised in incorruption. We will have an incorruptible body, which is supernatural. This natural body is going to corrupt. It's going to fall apart. It will decompose. Look at the next verse. He says, verse 44, it is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. So understand this. The angels are spirits, ministering spirits, right? They're here to serve us and God, and they are a flame of fire. They are spirit only, and it's like a fire. Then there's human beings. We are body, soul, and spirit. So we have a spirit in us, right? We have that flame of fire, sort of, but we're not celestial. We are natural. We are terrestrial. We're bound to the terrain. We're bound to this earth. So this new body, this spiritual body, is different from a regular human being. It's different from an angel. And it's not like God, but we will be in the likeness of Jesus Christ. When we're resurrected, we will not be gods, okay? But we will be in the likeness of this new body that Jesus Christ has. Notice Jesus came in the form of a man, the form of a spirit, the likeness of man, and he died and rose again, a bodily resurrection, and that body was a new thing. It was a body that was unlike any other body that's ever existed. He was the first begotten from the dead. He was the first one to put on this type of a body. Our body will be like that. So when we're resurrected, don't think about just flesh and blood, right? Flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. Our blood isn't going up there. This old rotten flesh isn't going up there. But yet we will have a, a different type of spiritual body. That is what we will be made up of. Look at verse 45. And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now, the last Adam is Jesus Christ, right? That last Adam being the quickening spirit, he had the power of the living God because he was God in his spirit, and he gave us the comforter. So the first Adam was a corruptible man. He sinned. He fell. He died. He's still dead. Now, his soul's in heaven. His body is gone. The last Adam, which is Jesus Christ, is alive forevermore. He was a quickening spirit. He had the spirit of God. He had the power of death and life. He had the power to resurrect the dead. You know, a lot of times people will say, oh, Adam, you're, you're named after Adam. Boy, he really messed it up for all of us, didn't he? You know, I say, yeah, right? Well, I, I claim the last Adam. 
I claim Jesus Christ because he fixed it for everybody. Look what he says in verse 46. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. God made us natural. We must be born again. That's born in the Spirit. Once we're born in the Spirit, then one day we will resurrect in the Spirit, just as Christ was the first fruits, so also we will be resurrected as well. Verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. He says, right now, you have the same body type that the first Adam had. But it's necessary that one day you will have the same body type that the second Adam had because he was the first begotten from the dead. He is the first fruits. He has a spiritual body. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. We're going to have that spiritual body one day. This is what we look forward to. We are begotten again unto a lively hope, the Bible says, right? We are begotten again through the gospel of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as he rose from the dead, having a spiritual body, hey, it was same, that same body, but now it's a changed body. Here it says, we shall be changed. Verse 53, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now look, if you are immortal, that means you cannot die. At the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when he comes back at his second coming, you will not be able to die ever in the future. Your body will be incapable of death. That's when he begins to conquer death. Look what it says, verse 54. So in this corruptible body shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Right? The, the law is to show us our sin, to show us that we have broken God's law. And the weakness of the flesh is sin. That this flesh is still sinful flesh. And one day we'll overcome that. Not only will we be immortal and not able to die, I believe we'll also be unable to sin as well. Look what he says in verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Hey, that's what our church is named after, this verse right here. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. You know, you have a resurrection one day, and when you are brought back, you will be incapable of death. You will be incapable of sin. So for the time being, while you're on the earth, ought you not to live for God? Shouldn't you make your priorities that of serving Him and getting ready for that event that's in the future? This is His promise. Go to Isaiah chapter 63. Isaiah chapter 63. We're almost done here. I want to I take this last minute to kind of show some Old Testament references to the victory of Christ, the victory over death that will come, or resurrection a little bit. And, you know, everything that will happen in the end has already been foretold, Old and New Testament. And some of it's a little bit harder to be understood, but, you know, the Bible teaches line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. What it does not say is, read this verse and then go back to the Greek and then go read some Catholic so-called father of the faith. All right, that's wicked as hell. That's not how you understand the Bible. That's how you get bad doctrine. 
Now, if you, have a, if you run into something you don't understand, if you see a phrase that, that kind of baffles you, step number one is take it on faith that God is true and every man is a liar. So, hey, I may not understand it. I may think it means something different. But here's what I do know. Salvation's faith alone, right? God is perfect and holy and righteous. Man is capable of all sorts of stupid stuff. So, you know, don't make any assumptions about the text or about God that are inappropriate. You have to start from a humble heart and say, okay, Lord, I don't get this. But what you're saying must be right. So if I, I misunderstand it, forgive me. Help me to understand it. Help me find line upon line. Help me to find some references to better understand your word. Isaiah 53 is a very interesting passage. There are some, cross, there are some parallels to what we see in Isaiah 53. But we're going to look at Isaiah 63. Look at verse number 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. So here again, we're talking about God, and he's talking about his salvation. He says, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and in thy garments like him that treadeth the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. So what's he saying here? Right? It's talking about Christ. Doesn't this sound familiar? This is the wrath of God. This is the wrath of the Lamb where He begins to tread the winepress. He begins to destroy people because of their wickedness. In Revelation 14, he says, The angel thrust in his sickle in the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even to the horses' bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. So in Revelation 14, it says, God's wrath is like a winepress. He's going to get in there. You know, a winepress is where they put all the grapes in there, and he goes in there and starts stomping them. So here we see a picture of God's wrath to come. Jesus is going to set things right on the earth. When we see strange things happening, sometimes we have to sit back and say, hey, let God judge them. God's going to take care of it. One day he'll set it straight. So here we see him talking about the wrath of God. In Revelation 19 it says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So who is this in red apparel coming from Basra? That's to save. Well, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? This is an Old Testament reference. Look at verse 4. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. Now, the Redeemer is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, it's talking about Jesus coming, but it's the day of his vengeance. In Luke 21, it says, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things that are written may be fulfilled. Luke 21 tells us about Jerusalem being encompassed with armies. It talks about the Son of God coming in clouds, right? So, I mean, here we're talking about the Lord. Why does he come? To resurrect us. What happens after the resurrection? He pours out his wrath, right? We go through the tribulation, the Lord returns, and then he pours out his wrath on the earth. Look at verse number five. And I looked, and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury had upheld me. Now this phrase, arm, is often referenced to Jesus also, right? How, how does the Father deliver? Through His arm, through, through His Son, through Jesus Christ. How do we obtain that salvation? How did God save us? By sending His own Son in the form of sinful flesh. Look at verse 8. For He said, Surely they are My people, children that will not lie. So He was their Savior. In all their affliction was He afflicted, and the angel of His presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. So again, he said he's reminding them in the Old Testament how the angel of the Lord would come down, that he was their savior, he was their redeemer, right? The angel of the Lord was Jesus before he was born of a virgin, right? That was the son of God, the angel of his presence, it calls him. But there's something interesting here, you know, showing that the son was used as the savior. Look what it says in verse 16. 
Doubtless, thou art our father. Though Abraham be ignorant of us, and Israel acknowledge us not, thou, O Lord, art our father, our redeemer. Thy name is from everlasting. Now this is very interesting because he's the son, right? He's not God the father. He is our redeemer and our savior, but here he's kind of comparing him like a father. Now turn to Isaiah 9, 6. I think, I, I think Isaiah 63 may give us a glimpse of an understanding into Isaiah 9, 6, how that Jesus Christ will be begetting us from the dead. One day he's going to raise us up from the dead. It is his voice that will call down and raise us up. Right? He's always been the son. He is from everlasting. Right? You remember the parable that was given about the son being sent to the vineyard? He didn't become the son when he got to the vineyard. He was the son before he got there. And yet that was the arm of his salvation. That's how the father redeemed us was by sending his very own son. You know, all that are in the graves will hear the voice of the son. The name father is often used of people that are not truly a father. You know, uh, Joseph, it said it was, he was like a father unto Pharaoh. Naaman the Syrian, you know, his servants called him a father. They said, if, Father, if they had asked you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? So he went and dipped and he was cleaned. Now, the same way Paul talks about uh, his converts, you know, of Timothy, he says he calls him a son. He's not really physically a son, but there's the spiritual connotation there. And so I think in Isaiah 63, it may give us a glimpse of an understanding of perhaps how, even though Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is not God the Father, He's not really called the Father, but he's, it's like He will beget us again. He's the first begotten of the dead. He will also resurrect us. Now you're in Isaiah chapter 9, look at verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now look, some of these titles are interchangeable with God the Father, God the Son, but when it says the Everlasting Father, you guys know there's some controversy. People say, oh, well that must mean that Jesus is really the Father. No, that's impossible. Right? The Son existed, it was, the Son was sent by the Father, but yet Jesus Christ will be like a Father unto us when He raises us up again. We are begotten again through the Gospel. We will be brought forth from the grave by Jesus Christ as He carries us into eternity. Look at verse number, verse number 7. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. What's he saying? Jesus Christ has a kingdom coming. We enter into that kingdom when he calls us out of the grave. When he comes back and resurrects us, he will lead us in, he will give us the power of judgment over the nations, of ruling and reigning with him. Look, one day we're all going to be resurrected. One day we will be begotten from the dead. Right? Today we're born again by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And His promise is that one day we also will be begotten from the dead just as He was. He was the first fruits of them that slept, and one day we will also be resurrected as He was. Revelation 1, He said, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Hey, thank God that Jesus came to the earth. Thank God that he died for our sins. You know, he is the only begotten son of God. He has always existed and he always will. He will be in the millennium. He will be in the new heaven and new earth. And we will be there with him, changed in our likeness in this new spiritual body. These are his promises we have to look forward to. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the fact that you've given us life beyond the grave. Lord, thank you for conquering hell and death and giving us that victory. Lord, we love you and we thank you for the, just the freedom that you've given us in Christ to believe the gospel and also to go out and preach the gospel. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take these things for granted and that you would help us to be good ministers for you. Lord, I pray you bless our time together tonight and give us a safe trip home. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.